Welcome, everyone. We're delighted that you could be with us tonight. I'm Tricia Perito, Director of the Town of Pelham Public Library in Lower Westchester. We're thrilled to be able to offer this program and are happy to be partnering with White Plains Public Library and Book Yaya. And I'm pleased to introduce you to our host for this evening, and that is Delane Mitchell of Book Yaya, and she will uh, take it over from here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. I am thrilled and delighted to be here tonight with y'all. So happy people are still joining us. Uh, my name is Delane Michelle. I'm so happy to have this series with the library. As some of y'all know, I created a reading series called Spoken Interludes back in 1996 in LA, which is another reason these two writers tonight have a particularly special place in my heart. Um, and from Spoken Interludes, my husband and I created Book Yaya, a place online where writers and readers can connect in events and launched very happily uh, with great honor being able to be in partnership with the Westchester County Library System to bring you events. I can't think of a better place than to celebrate books, but libraries where I don't know one writer who we didn't grow up that being our own kind of candy store. So um, when this uh, series started, I immediately emailed Rachel and said, Rachel, you have a book, come do it. Who do you want to be in conversation with? And she said, uh, my great friend, Steph Cha. And that's another wonderful thing about these series is you start with one writer you know and love and you get introduced to another I'm chagrined that I didn't know about Steph before, but the happy thing is that I do now. now. So we are celebrating their two books tonight. Uh, we are starting tonight with Steph, who will read first, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her before she does. Steph Cha is the author of Your House Will Pay, winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the California Book Award and the Juniper Song. She's also the writer of the Juniper Song Crime Trilogy. She is a critic whose work has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and the Los Angeles Review of Books, where she served as noir editor and is the current series editor of the Best American Mystery and Suspense Anthology. A native of the San Fernando Valley, she lives in Los Angeles with her family. Um, Steph will read and then Rachel will read. I'm going to uh, let tell you all a little bit about Rachel and the guidelines for the evening, and then we'll let Steph and Rachel read to us from their books. Rachel Housel Hall is the author of the best-selling novel, They All Fall Down, which was nominated for the Anthony Award, the ITW Award, and the Lefty Award. Rachel writes the acclaimed Lou Norton series, including Land of Shadows, Skies of Ash, Trails of Echoes, and City of Saviors. She is also the co-author of The Good Sister with James Patterson, which was included in the New York Times bestseller, The Family Lawyer. She is currently on the board of directors for the Southern California chapter of Mystery Writers of America and lives in Los Angeles. Um, guidelines for this evening so that it's a happy event for everyone. Please keep your microphone muted unless you're asking a question. And if you can, please refrain from moving around during the event. Or if you need to do that, please just turn off your camera. After the writers read, we're going to have a discussion. If you'd like to ask a question, there are a few different ways you can do that. You can click on the participants button and next to your name, if you highlight your name, you'll see a button that says more and you can click raise hand and we'll look for your raised hand there. You can go to the button that says reactions under the screen and if you click there, you will see a hand that you can press and we'll see your hand there. Or you can write your question in the chat feature, click on chat, the chat feature will appear on the right side of your screen and you can click, um, you can write a question there. Let me know if you want me to ask it for you or if you would rather ask it and we will be able to have um, a wonderful discussion with Rachel and Steph. So without further ado, Steph is going to read from her novel, Your House Will Pay. Please help me welcome Steph Cha. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, my first guest editor as a series editor for Best American is your cousin, Alifair Burke. Oh, how great. <laughs> so it's such a fun discussion coming up. Yeah, that's so fun to find out. Thank you for telling me. I know she adored you. Yeah, no, um, it, it was really wonderful working with her. Um, so um, I'm going to read a section from my book, Your House Will Pay. Um, 
you don't need to know that much about this section. The background is that uh, the point of view character's mother has been shot and has just come home from the hospital. Um, she has possibly been shot in a revenge shooting, and so that's that's part of what uh, that's part of the context that you need for this scene. Um, so Grace is about to give her mother a sponge bath. Grace wasn't sure how best to help a recovering gunshot victim get out of bed, but somehow she and Yvonne managed to fumble up together. She held her mother's waist, hoisted her side against her own. Even with her plodding, uneven gait, Yvonne was troublingly light, just a brittle frame weighed down by sweaty pajamas. Grace was accustomed to seeing Yvonne naked. They went to the Korean spa together often enough, but she had to hide her horror as she helped her mother out of her clothes. Yvonne had lost a startling amount of weight, more than Grace would have thought possible, even lying unconscious in a hospital room for a week. Her skin, soft and thin like worn leather, seemed to hang loose on her body. This struck Grace harder at first than the actual wounds, covered neatly with gauze and bandages. Run some hot water, said Yvonne. The tub was empty. The instructions warned against letting the wounds soak. Just a little bit. I'm cold. Grace let the tub fill up two inches while her mother shivered against her. Yvonne sat on the rim and gripped Grace's shoulder as she swung her legs inside, testing the water with her toes. She nodded and Grace helped lower her into the tub. Yvonne sighed as she sat down. This is pathetic. It was hard to argue with that. She looked small and breakable, crouched naked, spine curved, the outline of her vertebrae showing through her skin. She'd been shot in the front, and the bullet had exited her body beneath her ribs. The wound was dressed, but there was a large bruise all around it, a halo of purple and green. Grace took the mixing bowl she'd grabbed from the kitchen and filled it with hot water. Oma, she said, lift your head. Let's, wa let's wash your hair first. How many times had Yvonne bathed her daughters in this tub? Grace wasn't sure how old she was when she started bathing on her own but she had vivid memories of being in the tub, both with and without her sister, their mother, never their father, squatting on the bathroom floor, washing their hair. Even after Grace started showering, Yvonne would force her to submit to Demidi at least once or twice a year, scrubbing with a coarse cloth until great gray worms of dead skin and dirt emerged from every surface of her body, leaving her pink and raw and clean. Grace always disliked this painful ritual, even more so when she realized it wasn't something most of the other kids suffered. She remembered the night she put an end to it. She must have been 12 or 13, not a child anymore by her own calculation. Yvonne had walked into the bathroom while Grace was showering. Back then, her sister was the only one in the house who ever locked a door. Yvonne was singing her Demidi song, a silly little jingle set to a Korean pop song. De, 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 de. It had cracked Grace up when she was younger, but that night it grated on her, the cutesy intrusion on her privacy. She snapped at Yvonne in a way that stunned them both. What she could see of her mother's face through the steamed glass filled Grace with shame. She lathered Yvonne's hair. It felt thin and fragile between her fingers. Grace noticed the gray roots growing from the top of her bowed head, the cheap dark brown job, dye job turning purple. You can shampoo harder, my head's not injured, said Yvonne. Here, I'll just do it. Before Grace could stop her, she brushed her daughter's limp hands out of the way and started working her scalp with unnecessary vigor. It was a sulky move, not typical of Yvonne, and it brought the sting of tears to Grace's eyes. Her mother hated to be helpless, and Grace had no idea how to take care of her. Yvonne let out a yelp and dropped her arms, then wrapped them tight across her abdomen. Oh ma, just stay still. You have a hole in your fucking torso. Grace almost covered her mouth. She never swore in her front of her mother, let alone at her, and she saw that it made Yvonne flinch. But she let it stay said. It was undeniably true. Yvonne stopped resisting, and Grace did her best washing her hair, then her body. You used to love when I washed your back, said Yvonne, subdued, as Grace sponged her shoulder blades with soapy water. Do you remember? Grace nodded, then realized her mother couldn't see and made a sound of agreement. You liked when I drew shapes. We used to practice the alphabet during bath time. Grace could feel the gliding touch of her mother's fingers, the trick tickly zags of M, W, Z, the long straight lines of hungo vowels. I have to clean the wounds, she said. 
She peeled the dressing free and sucked in her gasp as she stared at the bullet hole. It was a hideous thing, dark and gory, meat colored. The exposed inside of the body never meant to see the light of day. She dabbed at it uncertainly and Yvonne groaned. Her back clenched under Grace's hands. Grace could not imagine this kind of pain. Yvonne's breath was heavy. She hugged her knees as Grace redressed the exit wound. Someone told you, didn't they? She spoke into her knees so softly, Grace wasn't sure she heard right. Oma? Appa told me. Grace was silent. She'd been waiting to have this conversation, but now that it was here, she wanted to punt it to a future Grace, one who was better and wiser and not staring at her mother's naked gunshot back. You can barely stand to look at me. You think I haven't noticed? Because of something I did before you were born. Grace couldn't think of a single thing to say. You don't know what it was like back then. Koreans were dying, did you know that? We were getting robbed at gunpoint, murdered for cash and beer. These gangsters, they were like animals. I didn't even want to be there. I begged your father to sell the store. Miriam was only a baby. I was scared something would happen to us. But she was just a teenage girl, said Grace. She couldn't bring herself to say the name out loud and hear it hang in the air. There was silence and then a sob. It was a mistake. I wish every day I could undo what happened, but I can't. How much do I have to pay for it, for that one mistake? Do I have to lose my daughters? Will that make it right? You're not losing your daughters, Amma. Grace started to cry, overwhelmed with pity and rage and love and disgust. For one thing, we're both alive. She went back to the task at hand, the one that was defined and doable, and Yvonne grew still and quiet under Grace's clumsy touch. This was all wrong. Grace rarely fought with her mother. She was this peacekeeper, the easy child, the one who held steady while Miriam claimed the spotlight. But maybe this wasn't a fight at all, because what was negotiable? Where was the resolution? Grace could never accept what her mother had done. It would always be between them. Grace, stop crying, said Yvonne, in the stern voice she'd used to shush her when Grace acted petulant as a child. It had the same effect as when Grace was younger. She cried harder. Grace, stop it. I'm sorry, I can't help it, she sniffed inhaling a thick glob of snot. This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. She felt herself turn red. It was a ridiculous thing to say, she knew, when a girl had died, when her friends and family had lived through her murder. Yet it was clear too that Yvonne felt victimized by her history, as if the girl's death were something that had happened to her. And didn't Grace have the stronger grievance? She was an innocent. Her mother had sinned and had failed to protect her from the fallout. Yvonne turned her head to face her and smiled an exhausted, heartbroken smile. Good, then I can't have been such a bad mom. She stretched her arms back and rested them on the floor of the tub, exposing her naked front. She nodded at the bandages there with her chin. Help me with this. Grace opened the dressing and gazed at the startling wound, the hole blown open between beneath her mother's slack, emptied breasts. Okay, that's uh, it from me. Thank you. Wow. I love that part. That was beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steph. <sighs> what a powerful scene. Um, Rachel, you want to take a quick little second? <laughs> right. So I, so, so I guess I follow that. <laughs> well, thank you. know, fortunately your book is equally powerful, but um, yeah, that was, no, that's, that's, I, I loved that story. Um, yeah. yeah. It is so powerful. That scene. Yeah. A killer. Um, I'm going to be reading from Yes. A fabulous book. Okay. <laughs> so this is a story of um, a new private investigator named Grayson Sykes, who gets her very first assignment, which is to find a missing woman named Isabel Lincoln. Her client is a hotshot doctor at UCLA, Ian O'Donnell, and. Uh, th this is very new for, uh, for, for Gray, and she comes in very green. And the scene I'm reading right now will be uh, the intake meeting with her and Dr. O'Donnell um, talking about where Isabel could have gone. Because the problem is, Isabel may want to stay missing. So, my glasses. So he just asked her, you know, where she could have gone. Palm Springs or Vegas? Las Vegas used to be a great disappearing town before the casino owners installed all those surveillance cameras, before sorority girls snapped and boomeranged and selfied, sometimes catching random taggable folks in the background. 
It was damn near impossible to hide in Vegas now. Gray asked, is it possible? No ink coming from the nib of her borrowed pen. She wanted the earth to gobble her up for good. Since the earth refused to move, she lifted the binder some so that Ian O'Donnell couldn't see that the words she wrote on her pad were now invisible. Is it possible that e Isabel just didn't want to come back this last time? Because Isabel's disappeared before. The doctor's green eyes flared. We have a future together. I'm a nice guy and, and there's her family. I don't think she would have left them to get back at me. No way. She's selfish, that's her problem. Thinks only about herself. And part of me wants to, part of you wants to what? He pinched his lip. You don't think she wants to come back, Grace said. Why then does she need to be found? He turned a sad pink. Because I want my dog. Are there other folks I should talk to? Isabel's parents, Joe and Rebecca Lawrence, her best friend, Taya something, her coworkers, Farah, Beth and Nan, and Pastor Bernard Dunlop. Oh, the doctor added. And one time this guy Omar texted her while she was in the shower. I took down the number, but never called it. Don't know who the hell he is. Did you read Omar's text message? Nope, her phone was locked. Could you send those numbers to... Gray offered her new phone number and Eno O'Donnell texted contact information for everyone except the Lawrence's. I've never met her parents, he said. Taya's been my go-between in this craziness. When was the last time you talked with Taya? I saw her about two weeks ago. She still hadn't seen Iz. Gray held up the intake form. On here, you describe Isabel as being white. I'm looking at her and I'm not seeing that, which means that other people won't see that either. She's biracial. She prefers to check that box instead of the other box. The other box? Ian waved his hand. I don't see color. She's human to me. Gray's nerves jangled and she was almost certain that her eyes had crossed. He cocked an eyebrow. What? Gray jammed her lips together. Is and I, we're post-racial and really, do you act like this with all your clients? He sighed at her, just like the white boys she dated back when Public Enemy and Air Jordans had crossed color lines. What questions should I ask her to prove that she's Isabel and that she's okay? Ian O'Donnell rubbed his chin as he thought. What was my first car? What was my first gift to her? And what am I allergic to? Ian, 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 even in Isabel's proof of life. Did you and Isabel live together? She asked. We were talking about her moving to my place, but we hadn't done it yet probably because she smelled crazy on him and didn't want to get it into her favorite coat. Hard to get the stink of nuts out of wool. Gray had lost many a good outfit that way. I helped her pay her rent though, he said. Since her credit shot, I hold the lease. Where does she live? Oh, some neighborhood. I don't know. I don't go over there a lot. Never went over there before we started dating. He then recited Isabel's address on Don Lorenzo Drive. That's off Stalker Street, Gray said, in Baldwin Hills. Sure, I don't know that part of town. Tina Turner had a home there. John Singleton, Tom Bradley, Ray Charles. Wow, he said, unimpressed. Anyway, can I meet you there later today? Awesome. So where do you think she went? The desert or the strip? He lowered his, his chin to gaze down at her. If I knew that, I wouldn't be asking you for help now, would I? She thought of his single nice gesture toward her, the gift of water, one small bottle. Though she was fake smiling, she wanted to lunge across the desk and drive his cheap dry pen through his golden cheek. He frowned at her as though she were a child. Her friends probably think I've done something to her. I haven't touched her. I haven't seen her and I would never ever hurt her. Like I said, I'm a nice guy. We're a typical couple. Yes, I'd scream. Yes, she'd scream. I'd get mad, she'd get mad. We'd both scream. Our last argument though, she told me that she hated me, that she'd kill me if she could get away with it, which was unbelievable. I know she didn't mean it, but God damn it hurt hearing that. And then to take my dog on top of that? There was a knock on the door and a cute blonde nurse with Michelle Pfeiffer eyes poked her head in to say, we need you, Dr. O. It's getting crazy out here. Ian O'Donnell offered hot nurse Pfeiffer a ready-made smile. I'm almost done, Trin. A moment passed after the nurse had closed the door. Then Ian's eyes and Gray's eyes met. His now shimmered with tears while hers remained as dry and flat as all of Los Angeles. 
those dry and flat eyes doubted that they were looking upon a man madly, deeply, truly in love because weren't all men madly, deeply, truly in love before they were no longer madly, deeply, truly in love minutes before they shot up classrooms, sanctuaries, dental offices, or bedrooms, baby boyfriends and husbands, baby daddies, and one night stands were always madly, deeply, truly in love, bloody love, crazy love, love you to death kind of love. Gray was a skeptic, a cynic, an agnostic of love. She believed more in Yetis, chemtrails, and human meat restaurants than in that four-letter word. Here's your pen, she said now, dropping the doctor's non-working writing utensil back into its cup. Ian O'Donnell stood from his chair. I'd like a report from you at the end of each day. Nick promised that in my contract. Even if it's just a couple of sentences, I want to know your progress, who you talked to, what they said, etc. Gray closed her binder with a pop. Certainly. No excuses, every day, you understand? Ian O'Donnell, the hero, the God, the man who healed people every day, the man who always got what he wanted from women. He'd expect nothing less from gay, Greg. Yeah, he had no idea. Mm, and that's it now. I love, I love that scene. Boy, y'all two really went for the uh, <laughs> very distilled, I think, kind of essences of both of your books, so. Um, the great witty repartee of Gray kind of shooting over his head. I love yes. that. Um, Steph, do you want to, before we start the discussion, since Rachel gave a little um, synopsis of her book, do you want to talk a little bit more? Do either of y'all both want to talk a little bit more about your books before I ask a question? Or do y'all want to want me to jump in? Because I certainly have things to ask. But if y'all wanted to give a little more background or no, y'all good? Um I'm, I'm ha Rachel, what do you want to do? I'm happy to just jump in. Okay. That's fine. Good. Although I think you should say, you know, what it is because this, the scene with the mom and, and Grace is just a small part of this huge sprawling LA story. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. So it's, this book uh, is a, it takes place in 2019. I can't say contemporary LA anymore because LA has changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, it's a contemporary LA novel that has roots in the early nineties, um, you know, back in kind of like the post Rodney King days. Um, and it's based on the murder of Latasha Harlins who was a 15 year old black girl who um, was murdered by a uh, Korean shopkeeper um, and the shopkeeper was um, convicted of voluntary manslaughter, but then sentenced to no jail time. And it became this kind of flashpoint for um, this uh, longstanding tension between um, Korean business people who went into South Central LA and the, and the community members who lived there who were largely black people who did not appreciate, you know, the kind of the, the racism and um, high prices of these kind of corner stores. And so it became this kind of natural spot for all of that to blow up. And it became also one of the underlying causes of the rioting uh, in 1992 and a reason that Korean businesses were targeted. Um, but that's that it, it, but the story is kind of based uh, about like the family members in present day. It's, it's a crime novel that um, is not exactly a mystery novel like my other ones were. Um, but it, it kind of looks at LA and I guess the US through the lens of crime. Yeah. Um, Great. Definitely. And, and I would say it, it, it's important to me when I, when I read this book because I am a native of Los Angeles and my mom worked up the street uh, from Florence and Normandy where everything like Went down. set off for the uprisings of 92. And everything that I write, which are mostly all LA stories, uh, deal with how shop owners looked at you, how LAPD looked at you, how being black in Los Angeles shaped, you know, who, who I am today. So I, 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 I love your house will pay because it, it, what you're talking about played a huge part in, in, in my growth. Oh, thanks, Rachel. It's, ac it's actually, a, you know, we were talking about this before the event started, but Rachel and I have been, uh, this is not our first event together. And I love doing events with you because we kind of have this history and, you know, we've now been on, I feel like, I feel like uh, 
we've been on the circuit for like three or four books together, you yeah. know, <laughs> so it's kind of fun. And it's also been fun seeing you pivot from writing a police series to a PI series. Like I was really excited about that. And, but I, I love, I love that you write about LA and I love that, the, I love the way you write about LA. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Steph, you're from the San Fernando Valley, which as we know, I lived in LA for 15 years, but a lot of people may not know is part of Los Angeles, but just over the hill, LA has so many different parts, kind of like Westchester, but much more distinct. And, um, and I, I love that y'all are <laughs> women writing about Los Angeles, particularly that you're writing about crime in mm -hmm. Los Angeles and this lens of looking at the world. LA is such a microcosm of, you know, what we can be, what goes wrong, what is wrong, while trying not to make it wrong, I think, from when I lived there. It's my passion of that is that city. Um, and and Steph, you know, I feel like what you do with your book is is reaching back to the early 90s, which is really, you know, LA changed completely, it pivoted completely from that point. And Rachel, as you said, that's what made you, and it informs your main character and how she views the world. So if you two want to mind, and, and we already have a question from a participant, but just to set the stage, if you two want to mind, I'd love to hear you talk about writing about Los Angeles as women, um, why you picked crime to look at it through this lens, and Steph, while your book directly looks at the early 90s, how that has informed your work, your view, um, all of that would be a great kind of leaping off place if y'all wouldn't mind addressing those things. Yeah. Um, so I am, I am Gen X. So I was in that weird time where everything was analog and then digital, where we were all kind of mobile, you know, everyone got their driver's license in, you know, my age group. Uh, we all partied at in Westwood and by UCLA. But we also, you know, were kind of integrating through busing. So we got to be around, you know, white kids a lot, but we still weren't a part of it. I, Steph growing up in the Valley is like, you know, we had the whole Valley girl and we dressed the preppy way and there was so much mixture of cultures there, but we still as, as black folks, you know, weren't totally, uh, acknowledged or respected for our role in, in city, city things. And you could see a lot of that by not seeing yourself on TV. Like there are a lot of great LA stories. And I, you know, grew up reading, of course, Michael Connolly and, and seeing all the Adam 12 and all these, you know, great, great LA stories, but I never saw black folks one in our, well, if I did see them in their own part of the world, it was always bad. Um, black folks and stories were always, you know, hookers or uh, drug dealers. They just weren't regular black people. And it was, again, never the part of town I grew up in, which was the Crenshaw area. And so I wanted to write stories of that part of Los Angeles that never, you know, got its due. And just like Hollywood and Echo Park and Silver Lake and Santa Monica. They're great stories there. They're just regular people living their lives, um, regular people faced with extraordinary things. And that's what why I like crime. I mean, there are just so many stories to tell in crime fiction. And, you know, crime allows you to uh, be as loose as, as you want with it, like uh, your house will pay with, with Steph, or the procedural. It's, it's, a very supportive uh, group of, of writers in mystery crime. Mm -hmm. And we're very interested in telling all kinds of stories. So yeah, I LA is ripe with uh, great stories and I am looking forward to getting to like 30% of them at least. Good for you. I'm thrilled that you're doing that. It makes me so happy. Um, and Steph, I'd love to hear you speak about those issues with your work and, and growing up in, in the Valley, which is such an interesting part of Los Angeles. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in this, I grew up in Encino, which is like very suburban, like, 
And I didn't really go into LA proper that much unless it was like to do stuff in Koreatown, you know, but I had, I feel like I had like a pretty sheltered, sequestered upbringing. Uh, and so I feel like a lot of my getting to know LA has happened since like I moved back after school, you know, like as an adult, I have a different relationship with the city than I used to. But when I, but um, when I went to college, I took a class on uh, American detective fiction. I, re I read Raymond Chandler for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't read literature about Los Angeles, really. Like that's, it wasn't part of, I don't know, there's not a lot of can canonical, like high school level canonical work that you read about Los Angeles. And so it was really fun for me to read about my city and kind of feel these little sparks of recognition. But I also thought that it would be fun to write. Actually, I initially thought it'd be fun to read um, a Raymond Chandler style story that, um, that kind of, matched more like of the LA that I knew, which was mm -hmm. this very Korean American version of Los Angeles and very contemporary too. Um, and so when I decided that I wanted to try my hand at writing a novel, I kind of gravitated to crime fiction because I wanted to write in conversation with Raymond Chandler. So I kind of backed into crime fiction, but once I wrote, once I started writing those books, I realized how versatile a crime is as a genre and just how much you're able to do and how much you're able to explore with crime. You know, and I kind of, I kind of approach it from the side of like treating crime as something that is, um, that is not abnormal and like extraneous to like mainstream society, but something that is like really intertwined with the way that people live, our, people live their lives. And I don't know. I mean, I think like, you know, even within my own family, like we have, we've had people go to jail and, you know, we've had, like, we've had, like, we've had stabbings and shootings, like in my own, like, in, you know, pretty small extended family. Um, and I think that like in a country where, you know, some huge percentage of like black men are incarcerated, I just feel like it's, it's kind of an experience that is not so unusual uh, mm -hmm. to kind of have these intersections um, with crime and I think it just tells you so much about society when you like kind of really dig in to like who's committing crimes who's becoming victim who's becoming victimized by crime like what are the circumstances that lead to people hurting each other and for pe and um, and also the way that these crimes are viewed and punished um, and so I, I find crime fiction really interesting for that reason you know and I also I will also say and I'm sure uh, Rachel has had a similar experience because we kind of came on to this kind of crime circuit or in a similar time, like early-ish 2010s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I also feel like when I started writing these books, um, the crime fiction world just looked a little bit different than it does now in that I did feel like a little bit, uh, a little bit unusual for being sure. a woman and for being non-white. And now that I, now that I've kind of and not that like there weren't other people around, but like now we have a stronger community, I feel like, and there are more of us, you know, I see some, I see some people from our crime writers of color group, like even like, even like in this, uh, in this, in this uh, meeting. Um, but, uh, you know, I have also noticed that like LA has become this kind of epicenter for this, right? Because like, you're here, Naomi, Gary, you know, Walter's yeah. here a lot of the time, you know, it's just kind of a, a really s strong core um, is based in LA. And I don't think that's coincidental. I think it's because like, this is such a versatile city with like so many different communities and things to right. talk about. And, yeah. you know, there's, um, and there, I think there's also maybe, I don't know, there's like a respect for the tradition of crime fiction in Los Angeles that maybe doesn't exist as strongly in other cities. I don't know. Yeah, I think I think it is because you know four million people over how many square yards we have everything and everyone here with every problem and it you know in, in that way it is a microcosm a and I think um, there's space for every story so I think you know crime fits here and I think it endures this this um, genre that we love is because everyone has been touched by it in some way from something petty like somebody stole my creamer from the, you know, refrigerator at work to murder, you know, we've all been victimized in some way. And I think, you know, a lot of times, yes, I'm scared of writing some of the things I write, but that's how I've always kind of figured things out and worked through my fears is writing. And I think people turn to that 
to turn to uh, crime for that same kind of thing. I mean, how many law and order SVUs and CSIs and they're popular because they help us figure things out. You know, mm-hmm. some of us may not ever find romance, but we've all been sick, you know, we've all been scared of something. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Well said. I, I have a few questions I want to uh, make sure get asked, but, but, and I hesitated interrupting y'all because I love what y'all are talking about, but um, let's go to these and then I'm sure they'll keep uh, shooting off. So we have like four or five. Oh, wow. The first one is from Prudence. Um, so Steph, I'm going to read this for you. Um, I'm curious about whether you actually had an experience dealing with someone in your own life who was, uh, who had a gunshot wound, being exposed to someone's damaged body. You captured it so beautifully and the emotional impact. Um, I'm um, sure the follow-up question to both of y'all, but I'll, Steph, I'll let you ask, uh, answer that one. And then I'll ask the follow-up to both of y'all. You know, I, um, I, I, I actually have, uh, but it was a weird thing because it happened after I started writing this book. Um, yeah. so my cousin, um, my cousin was killed by, I mean, he was, he was in the process of, he was in the process of robbing somebody. So it was like self-defense, but he was killed in self-defense. Um, and he went to the hospital first, uh, where he was, he lived for a week before he died. Um, and so I got to see him, uh, before he died. And, uh, I mean, I didn't see, I didn't see the wound. Um, I saw him, you know, in his last, in his last, uh, week, uh, you know, and that, and it was an interesting thing because I had been writing about this shooting that takes place in Northridge and he was literally, he was shot in Northridge. He was shot mm-hmm. by a CSUN. Um, and so it was this odd thing where I was at the hospital uh, and I discovered, for example, that like, that the Northridge hospital had a trauma center, which I actually didn't know in an earlier draft of the novel. I mean, I'm sure I would have figured this out at some point, but I had her I had her airlifted to County. And so I like revised that. I was like, oh, she'd actually just go to this hospital. Um, And when I was there, you know, I didn't know how serious it was because we were told he was going to live. You know, I was like taking pictures of like the hospital, you know, like the the, like the elevator lobby and stuff like that. And kind of like, you know, I I think when you're a writer you just absorb all these details especially when you think there's a good chance you're gonna use them. And I was very much in writer's mode. I mean, I was obviously also like concerned for my cousin, but you know, we really did think that he was gonna survive. Um, and so when, you know, when he died, it was just this whole weird thing. And I mean, obviously, and I, I, you know, when the book came out, I had to kind of talk to my uncle and say like, you know, like, just so you know, like when you read this book, there's going to be stuff that's familiar to you and it's gonna, it, it might be like hard for you to read, you know? And so I didn't set out to write this book because of my cousin but you know when he when he was killed uh i you know it kind of brought home a lot of the things that i'd already been thinking about just how just how personal this all is and how it's not you know it's not like stuff that happens to other people all the time you know sometimes it's uh sometimes sometimes it's uh you know i mean i i i guess it's why i write crime fiction in the first place because like I do care about the effect that crime has on families. Uh, and, uh, and I want to treat that as something that is like, not outside of the like real world, you know, that this is something that we actually very much live with. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, I, I don't remember whether I wrote that particular scene before or after, um, you know, maybe it was, maybe it was after, I don't know. Yeah. I'm so sorry about your cousin's death. That's, that's hard. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, he, he would be, I think he would be 30, he would be 31 now. He was 27. So that was in uh, 20, that was in 2016. Wow. Yeah, that's um, really heartbreaking. I don't have, uh, I don't believe gunshot wounds, but uh, there is battery. The, the, the story basically is about domestic abuse and uh, women escaping from that. And there's a sub story within the main story that tells um, a, a story about a woman named Natalie Dixon, who is in this, 
you know, initially lovely fairy tale kind of romance with uh, this guy who turns on her and he abuses her and she wants to escape. And so there are scenes where, yes, he hits her, he beats her. And, you know, fortunately, you know, I, I am in a happy marriage, so I haven't seen that from my end firsthand, but I have seen um, Battery firsthand. And it's a sound that you will never forget. And um, my co a cousin by marriage, uh, she was with someone who we thought was, you know, not necessarily a great guy, but you know, he wasn't offensive and they seemed to be happy together and he seemed to be kind of normal. That is until we got a call late one night that she had been found in her house almost, um, she heat stabbed her over 50 times and left her on the kitchen floor to die. And she pretended to be dead and he left. And that's when she eventually got a phone and called 911. And we were like, that guy, we couldn't believe it because he seemed so kind of like, you know, whatever. And so I, I seeing her and seeing like the, the keloids from her injuries, you know, you, especially as a writer, you, you pay attention to those things and how she touches them and how she tries to hide them. You know, all the things we do anyway to hide our trauma from each other. Um, I, I relied on that when, when writing a lot of those scenes. That's, that's, those are such powerful stories. Thank y'all for sharing that. That's, mm -hmm. um, it's really impressive how y'all have taken those things either that happened before or during and let it, you know, speak through your work um, and illustrate that this isn't something that, as Steph said, happens to other people yeah. and that it needs to be brought out in the open. Um, also from Prudence, uh, wondering who y'all look up to in terms of this genre of crime, and then we still have other other questions. So I know Steph that you had spoken about Raymond Chandler. If if you wanna, or if Rachel, you wanna start, but I imagine there are also other people. So if y'all wanna speak to that, I mean, our list is uh, probably the same. <laughs> sorry, what, sorry, what, Rachel? I said our list is probably the same in, in some ways. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say Walter was another yeah. person who I read in that same freshman year. Uh, uh, lit class and uh, you know he's obviously uh, huge I, I mean when you talk about LA crime he's I think he's the one that comes up with uh, Chandler um, we did an event with him a couple yeah. of years like the three of us did an event and it was such a trip I mean he's right before it closed the, the, the land the, everything closed down yeah That's cool. yeah now he's he, so he's a big one I mean it's just like it's cool that like once in a while we get to hang out with Walter Mosley. That's like <laughs> one of the fun things about becoming a published writer for me is like hanging out with other published writers I admire, including including Rachel and uh, mm -hmm. you know, other people in the genre. I love, um, you know, a lot of them are friends. Uh, uh, Naomi Hirahara is wonderful. Yes. I love her. Um, uh, Attica Locke. Yeah. Just incredible uh ivy pakoda i love her stuff megan abbott um i would say michael connelly too because yeah, I love michael connelly. He... He's, my, he's my uh he's my like uh he's the cop series that i like yeah. <laughs> other than yours you know? <laughs> yeah but he, you know, he, you know, he doesn't live here anymore he writes about los angeles with some love and respect and sorry, that's my my dog with her Kong that she just dropped at me, my feet. But yeah, he <laughs> writes about Los Angeles um, in a way that it's kind of encyclopedic. I don't even know if that was a word, but journalistic. Yeah, journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I actually read uh, the Lincoln Lawyer um, mm -hmm. during pandemic. I hadn't read that series before, and oh, yeah. it is so much fun. Like that book was just like candy. Like I loved it. I I, I, I went out and bought the next couple books in the series. Um, that's going to be a TV show at some point. Yeah. Uh, no, and you can tell when someone actually has been to Los Angeles and knows mm -hmm. the city, as opposed to someone who's kind of googling things. It's like. 
that's not there. No, we don't do that. Yes, of course we have breakfast sandwiches in Los Angeles. And, you know, it's like, I'm such a, I am such a stan of the city. I am, I, 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 As you yes, should. it has its issues, but I love LA and I want it to be portrayed correctly in, in mm-hmm. books I read, which is, you know, another reason why, you know, I love reading staff's books because we respect the city and the people who are here and, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Have, have, you read a, uh, have you read Joe Ide? Yes, I love Joe Ide. I love Joe Ide too. Uh, I haven't read any of these stories for those who don't know Joe. Yeah. Those books are really fun. I also love Sarah Grand and Elizabeth Hand. I can, I, you know what? I can go on and on. But uh, yeah, yeah jo- Joe Ide. Uh, I think, uh, he, yeah, I haven't read his new one, but I've read all the other IQ books. He was just uh, profiled in by the book in the ah. book review. So people mm-hmm. can, uh, can find him there. Yeah. And I'll just say quickly that being in LA for 15 years, Um, y'all are, which some people might not know, but being a novelist of any genre in Los Angeles is, is quite a remarkable feat because in LA, if you say you're a writer, I assume screenwriter, and there's a lot of wonderful kind of crowd (laughs) and saying, no, I actually write novels. And uh, I know that you and you two are part of a, of a wonderful group there that, uh, while screenplays are fabulous, it's, it's its own unique flavor being a novelist in LA, you have great, great ground to draw from and, and you're really using it because, you know, obviously prose is the writer's game more much, you know, screenplay as a director. So speaking of screenplays, um, Renee wants me to ask y'all, have you seen the now classic movie, Do the Right Thing, which has several scenes of interaction between Korean store owners and the black population of a Brooklyn neighborhood? That was from Renee. Yes. Um, uh, I, I, I saw Do the Right Thing in Westwood, which is UCLA. And when we came out after seeing the movie, there were riot cops lined up on Wilshire Boulevard, ready to arrest us all because they thought we too were going to throw, you know, trash cans through glass windows. So yes, um, again, I grew up in you know, Daryl Gates's Los Angeles and yeah. being followed around the stores. And when my husband and I first went to Paris, in 1990, no, 2001, right before 9-11, uh, we went into a toy store and we had been shopping all day and we had all our bags and we went into this toy store and we went to the counter and we were like trying to hand her our bags. And the Parisian store owner's like, why are you trying to give me your bags? And us growing up, you know, children of LA, black Los Angeles, we couldn't take our bags into the stores. So we assumed when we went to Europe that we had to hand our bags over and we didn't. She let us keep the bags and we actually went to the second level and we were in the store by ourselves with our bags. And as young, you know, 31 year olds, that was the first time we'd gone shopping without feeling like we were criminals. So yeah, and all that, you know, again, as a writer, you put all that in your, your. if you don't say it explicitly, this is what you think about when you're writing, how you were treated growing up. They're not so great in Paris either, though. I think, uh, didn't Oprah, oh. like, turned away by some, like, luxury store? <laughs> Big mistake, huge. No, it's all, it's, they just sound, oh, rich Black people. Yeah. We're so happy to be there. Let's treat them nice. We had a great time in Paris. We weren't, we weren't, um. But the, again, this was 2001, and it was obvious we were Americans. I actually, uh, I, ha- I actually haven't seen Do the Right Thing, which is a shameful thing to admit. Um, I know it's not an LA movie. It's on my list. I watch like, actually, I've been watching movies during the pandemic. But otherwise, I, I'm like a two movies a year kind of person. <laughs> like, I'm not a big <laughs> the right thing is, is definitely. Uh, I mean, I'm a huge Spike Lee fan. Yeah. Love, 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 love. He's, you know, I mean, to me, he is actually a director. Yeah. I yeah. was, I was gonna say the first yeah. scene of your house will pay is, uh, is yeah. the New Jack City riot. Yes. Uh, yeah. which, which I only knew about because uh, my friend. Do you know Peter Woods? No. He's a, he's like a small press publisher in LA, but uh, uh, he um, he went to school with Latasha Harlins. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, when I was kind of in early stages of this book, he like offered to talk to me. And one of the things he told me about was this like time that he like 
went to Westwood to watch New Jack City and they canceled the ship the, they canceled the premiere and there was like a three hour riot and he was like a 13 year old yeah uh, and he like stole like a giant cell phone <laughs> but yeah no that was like a thing like uh Westwood being afraid of black people right yeah uh, and actually there's a there's a for the New York people. Footnote to that is oh, that not Westchester, um, New York, Westchester, Los Angeles, UCLA, Westchester. Right, but I also just want to say real quickly, so Westwood in LA is where the movies would premiere and it's on the UCLA campus. So it's this weird yeah. kind of convergence of a lot of students around and you suddenly get like the LA, you know, Hollywood people going in for a premiere and first runs and um, yeah, yeah so when <laughs> Steph opens her book with that, it's all these populations coming together. But the yeah. other thing that Westwood that I find interesting is that like kind of before my time, it was like the place to go and hang out. And oh yeah, then, right. And then an Asian American girl was killed, killed. In yeah. that, like a, a by a stray bullet in a drive-by and like Westwood, com that was that, it. Like, a huge turning point for Westwood. It like shut yeah. down. It's like, yeah. so, so, you know, that's like another, footnote of Asian American LA history, I guess. Yeah. I want to make sure I ask all these amazing questions that are coming in. Um, okay, so Prudence says again, um, agreeing with y'all about how good it is to write about crime so that people can learn from this because isn't fiction supposed to expand your horizon? And she has another question later. Larry said that hours after arriving in Los Angeles, my car was broken into, stole my GPS too, laugh out loud. Sorry, Larry. Um, <laughs> and Larry said he's so good. We're assuming you probably mean Walter Mosley or maybe Joe. Yeah, um, so. Sarah Graham is good too, Larry says. Robin Swartz says, I want to commend you both on such great audiobook narration. I usually prefer to read, but I've really enjoyed listening to your books, which is lovely. Um, Katie says, I should do the right thing in my sociology through film class. Prudence. Um, LA can feel a bit surreal to some of us New Yorkers, but somewhat uh, like Florida. How do you think LA compares to Southern Florida? Am I wrong here? Again, I haven't read this stuff, meaning crime fiction in a while. So do y'all want to tackle how, uh, if y'all know Southern Florida, I don't know if y'all like do. Like Miami? I don't see. I don't know Florida. The, 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 know, the, the only similarity I see between LA and, and, and Miami is great food. But I think the vibe is totally different um, because there there is no down, even though we have a downtown LA, there is no downtown LA. There's so many things happening in so many other parts of the world. And there's so many, there's not one large dominant group of, I mean, yeah. I, I Yeah. It doesn't feel the same. The yeah. Heat, that's about it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Heat, that's it, yeah. And the beach, but not even, because um, you can get water in, in Miami. <laughs> it's too damn cold in LA. <laughs> uh, uh, so this is from Christopher. Uh, I was wondering if either author had seen HBO's Perry Mason. It seems LA was much more East Coast from, wait a minute, that just jumped. Um, sorry. It seems LA was much more East Coast from neighborhoods to ethnic concentrations to dense housing than World War II and then post-war post occurred. Is that massive change what gives us the LA of today that you wrote about? Did the city become less intimate? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay. So back when I think you're saying when Perry Mason was first filmed with Raymond Burr, uh, LA seemed more East Coast because the neighborhoods were more concentrated than World War II and post-war happened. Um, and I don't Kate, think I was never East Coast to be honest with you, but that's just me. And Kate has noticed that uh, Kate has noticed that a lot of the uh, Perry Mason scenes take place in Bunker Hill, which uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, no but longer exists, and now it's Dodger Stadium. Yeah, the hill was raised in the sixties. No, the yeah, the HBO show. Yeah, Chris, we know you mean the new reboot. We thought yeah. you both of them. So I have I, I have watched it. I actually have watched it. I thought it was, you know, I think you'd enjoy it, Rachel, because uh, really? it's the most Raymond Chandler thing that I've seen in a while. Uh, it has oh. that kind of uh, vibe. In fact, like it's, I kept thinking Perry. I kept thinking Perry Mason, the guy who plays Perry Mason, who's basically playing like how I would think of Marlowe. Oh, uh, 
So that's it's fun. Really good. Um, I mean, I write about contemporary LA. I don't always question how it became the way it became. I mean, in the book, in, in Your House Will Pay, I guess I do deal with some of the kind of, uh, one of the big things I deal with in Your House Will Pay is like the black exodus from LA, like central LA that has happened over the last like 25 years. That's not a post-World War II thing though. I mean, I guess well, everything with like black LA is like post, post-World War II, like when, when kind of these, it, it, like it was, LA was like this great place to be after, after the great migration and like in the early earlier decades. Um, yeah. But then like manufacturing left LA and now there's just like a huge sprawl. I mean, that's happened to like- well, also, well, also there were covenants. I mean- Oh yeah. My parents, I remember being in the back seat with my, there are four kids and my parents and we were working class and they'd have printouts of century 20, uh, you know, r r rental places. And there were places that listed either no children or no black people. Oh, right. And so you right. lived where you could one afford and two that would accept you. The house that I'm in now had a covenant that they couldn't sell to black people. So we tended to, to clump up where we were allowed to live and where we could afford to live. So some of it wasn't, you know, I'm going to select to live here. No, you live there because you. you got four black kids and it's the only place that you you can be and yeah a lot of um like what walter writes um that central avenue uh corridor central avenue was close to the train you know the the, the train lines near alameda which meant that it was close to manufacturing you know all the the, the good year plan and mcdonald douglas all the big jobs that black folks could get after the war you know, that's where you lived. You lived where you can get on a bus and go straight up a street to get to work. So some of it, you know, is self-selection. Some of it is you you live where you got to live. And now, you know, I live in a very, I live in a historic black area, the View Park, Windsor Hills, which is a part of Baldwin Hills and uh, Windsor Hills and Ladera Heights. And it's always been black, but because it's always been black, that means the real estate the houses don't cost as much as they would in Culver City, which is just three miles west of here. And now I ha we have a lot of young white families moving into our neighborhoods because you get a lot of house for a lot less of a price tag. So even that now, things are integrating because of economics. And people who had, you know, had no idea that this place existed are now living here. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and, and something that I found interesting too is that like, those neighborhoods that have stayed black are the ones that like are middle, upper middle class black neighborhoods as opposed to the poor black neighborhoods, which have like completely, not completely, but like have largely emptied out. So yeah. like South Central is like very Latino now. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's because people own homes in, mm -hmm. in like these kind of wealthier enclaves. And yeah. even that character is being under threat now. But I think the only reason that like there, there has been kind of a retention of the black population is because like there has been that next level of economic power. Mm -hmm. I wanna, I wanna share some comments with y'all. Y'all are fascinating, and I could talk to y'all for three more hours, and I know we all could. And uh, Prudence, who asked such great questions, had to jump off, but she's in two book clubs, and she's recommending both of y'all's books. For oh, thank you. So, um, how fun is that? Yeah. Um, Robin Swartz said, has Steph seen the recent short film, A Love Song for Latasha? So that's fascinating. Did you know that existed, Steph? We're right I, just, I just read about it. Like, <laughs> I feel like there was a piece about it in this, one of the newspapers like a week ago, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't gotten to it yet, but it's on my, it's on my list. Yeah, understandably. That's, that sounds amazing. I, I wanna see that too. Um, and Christopher, who also asked that earlier great question, said Central Avenue was Japanese before they were moved to the in, internment camps in right. Miami Hirahara. Yeah. Um, Robin says she saw the film a few months ago. Yeah. Um, I just have to say like how lovely to see so much audience involvement, um, you know, in these little screens and us all kind of separated. And it's because you two women are fabulous, fascinating, great writers. 
with your beautiful books and just so appreciative that you took the time to breathe with us tonight and can't wait to have you back for your next books. I'm going to turn it over to Christy Bauman from White Plains Library, but I want to thank y'all so much for making a cold snowy night back east, a really wonderful one warm with LA love and literature. Back thank to you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christy Bauman. I'm the programming li librarian at White Plains Public Library. I just wanted to say thank you to both Steph and Rachel for um, talking to everybody tonight. It was a fascinating lecture. Um, thank you to Book Yaya for giving the libraries the opportunity to have these events. They're really important and we really appreciate the help. Um, we hope you all really enjoyed the program. There are going to be future programs with Book Yaya as well, so keep your um, eyes peeled. You can take a look at Book Yaya's website, or you can take a look at your local library's website. Thank you for coming, and have a good night. Hey, thank you, Christy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rachel and Steph, and enjoy their fabulous novels. Y'all have a great night. Good night. Thank you.